Thank you. Can you hear me? Anyway, my yes. voice is quite loud enough. So, okay. So, a little disclaimer. Whatever I'm going to speak in this session are my, just my views. They have no reflection on my company. Okay. So, as um, Sam mentioned, I am a cybersecurity architect with 6.6, .6, now a part of Accenture. Um, I started out as a developer. So, I do understand the developer aspect of writing code, especially secure code. And I have worked in InfoSec, I've worked in various roles, so I understand where the security people come from. And this, okay, so, yeah. And then I, as we go along, I just want to tell how sometimes architects get caught between developers and InfoSec guys while trying to solve problems and we see things from both sides. Okay, so this is the agenda for today's meeting how simple sometimes compromises can be, how to write insecure code, and the need for a developer guide. Now, um, before I start off, I would like to take a step back and give a little bit of a preface. So, pretty much anything in this world is made up of applications. Operating systems, browsers, firewalls, the underlying operating systems for IDS, IPS, your SAS tools, DAS tools, anything and everything, pretty much apart from bare metal servers, are made of um, applications. Applications are built by developers. Now, any little vulnerability getting in, bash, you know, the bash vulnerability, and then, of course, the supplier chain vulnerabilities, SQL injections, etc. I don't want to say the developers are responsible for it, but kind of they are, you know, in a way. So, uh, you know, I was a developer as well, so I have utmost, res you know, respect for developers, having been one. Um, so, what happens is that, uh, on a serious note, when the vulnerabilities do occur and compromises do take place, the problem is the companies get on the, you know, front page news. Okay, fine, they get on the front page news. But what really happens is the real impact, the ancillary impact is, on people like you and me, because it's our data that gets exposed if there is a data exfiltration. And where do we end up? We end up on the dark web. And because our identities may get compromised, digital, you know, uh, there may be fraud with our credit cards and our banking uh, accounts, and uh, there may be digital identity impersonation. So eventually we end up as a statistic on an IBM Ponemon report. I don't know how many of you follow IBM Ponemon report. It actually gives the cost of breaches per industry sector year-wise. So uh, now, developers, as I said, I have utmost respect for them. They do write code. They are very creative people. They convert, they take your requirements and convert it into something really beautiful. But really they're not security people. So. That's one thing. And on the other hand, we have got assurance people who are trying to make sure that the code is secure. Yes, but all said and done, assurance people sometimes are really not from development background. So when they tell you that, when they tell the developers that they've got to do input data validation, for example, how do developers do it? So the usual conversation that happens is, do you do input data validation? Yes, we do. Okay, done. Then we see a compromise. Now, the thing is, um, when, when people tell developers to do input data validation, they need to map it to something that is tangible, where the developers understand. For example, go do regex. Okay, that's fine. That's not an ideal situation. <coughs> but at least it is something. Use secure libraries. Again. Not a lot, but at least it tells people what to do and developers can relate to it. So with that background and because as architects, we get caught sometimes in between because InfoSec people don't allow a, a release to get out into production and developers can't really understand how to fix certain issues. So that's why we have these kind of compromises. They are all related to um, application. You can go and check them out. So, how does it happen, really? This is actually from OWASP Shepherd. It's one of my favorite uh, applications in the world. I don't know how many of you use it. It's really, really very good uh, exercise for learning application security. 
So sometimes your compromises can be as simple as this. Voila, you've got this. So, how, why does it take place? Because, oh, am I quiet? Okay. So you've got an asset which is of value to an adversary and then it's got a boundary. Everything has a boundary. And then you've got a threat actor who actually tries to compromise a vulnerability or a weakness. In this case, a SQL injection. And the impact is loss of confidentiality of data. And sometimes the mitigating control could be as simple as query parameterization. So if someone asks, if the InfoSec people ask developers, do query parameterization, probably the developers will do it. So now, having said that, um, sometimes, as I said, developers are not really security people. So here are some of the conversations that I have compiled over a period of my life in securities to, you know, how people write code. And I'm one of them, actually. So one of my experiences is actually in this one. So we have people telling us, why do you not do security controls in your application? We don't need to do that. We've got tools to resolve security issues. So I don't have to worry about it. You know, the point is, we do have SAST and DAS tools. Additionally, we pen test everything. Pen test is a cover all thing. So we don't need, and so we don't have to include security controls in our code. And the second one, I don't know how many of you have come across it. Let me distribute the security controls, checks everywhere, because I want to make my application secure. So what you're essentially trying to do is security with complexity. And so nobody can really find all the complexities in your code. Uh, I don't know how many of you are developers over here, so no offense to everybody, anybody, please. As I said, I was a developer as well, but this is something which you see some in life. And then the next one that you hear is, my code is secure, my code is unbreakable. It has never had a proven problem at all. So what we are essentially trying to apply over here is default deny principle. It's a security principle, but applied in a very different way. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then you got, I like using dynamic code. You know, it loads everything at runtime, reflection and class loading are beautiful features. Yes, but have you ever done hash? You know, now, I, I mean, I'm not so much into development, but if you have done any C programming, you would do hash include uh, xyz.h header. So if you don't know what that xyz.h file is, you know, you have a supply chain risk that is materializing. So in, in the, you know, process of nesting dynamic calls to reduce the size of code. Okay. And then one, let me not include any dynamic, you know, input data validation library on my project. Usually people include them in form.xml file. They say they don't want to include too many libraries on the project, it loads up. Yes, but what if you do have fields that require input data validation? So what? It is done by WAF. But WAF, you know, it's signature based. What if you create a signature, if someone creates a signature that is not detectable by WAF, why not just include input data validation in your pom.xml file? Then the next one, the language that I'm using is absolutely safe. Right. Uh, okay, I see people relating to it. Okay, so I'm not the only one in this whole thing. Okay. Then the next one, the application has access control methods that I have designed. It works. Yes, in a scenario. Have you considered X, Y, Z, one, two, three scenarios? Okay, it's anybody's guess. I can write my own logs. I like to write to STD, you know, STD out file logs so that I can include the debugging issues. We don't want log4j kind of stuff. Okay, fine, good luck with that. In you know, investigating any possible uh, compromises on your application. Okay. Now, just so you know, I've attributed a link over here. Many of these are available on the OWASP site where it says how to write insecure code, but then I have seen all of them and some of them are from my own experience where I made those mistakes. Then, there are some more. So you rely on security checks done everywhere in the code. Okay, and then we can write our own encryption standards. They are going to be more secure. We are going to test them out thoroughly and fully. Yep. 
then let's hard code our keys. Who can possibly want them and what for? Yes, okay. Then encryption is good. Let's do it everywhere. We, and this is the best one. Not the best one, but one of the best ones. We have HTTPS. We really can't go wrong with this. And this, a lot of people agree, okay? Not just developers. We have sec, InfoSec people also agreeing with it. I know my own code. I build my own authentication mechanisms. Yes, you have a username table and a password table in your database, and then anybody can do a SQL you know, Pull it out. Yes. Okay, good luck. <laughs> and then there's no need to apply security controls to sessions. Oh, my God. I've heard this so, so many times. They are just random numbers. How can a session replay take place? Who will want our random numbers? No, there are no, yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> and then hashes, birthday attacks don't work. They really don't. Okay. And finally, don't worry about it. It's all secure. We have never been breached. I've, I've heard this in every company, every client I've worked for. We are all secure. Okay. So in spite of all of that, we still have these breaches. So obviously something is actually going wrong. And really, the impact of this is that the tools capture security defects at a later stage in your development. And tools really do not fix defects. I know some tools claim to do fix defects, but they really don't. You need hands-on experience to hands-on work to fix those defects. So for example, you know, missing signatures for encryption of data on a mobile app, there's no way it's a tool can detect that if you're not actually encrypting your key, encrypting key on a mobile app. Privilege escalation, for example, it needs to be actually done hands-on in a manual way. Then vulnerabilities, you know, signatures that are hard to defect. So typically going back and fixing defects is a lot of rework. It takes a lot of time. It results in a lot of work. So the impact of this is that the exploitation of vulnerabilities like SQL injection, vulnerabilities in supply chain, third, you know, and or third parties, credential capture, they result into reputational loss of, for the organization and probably financial loss. So in effect, it actually is going to come back and bite you because it would affect your, uh, you know, pay check and your bonus. So make your life simple, developers, save time on rework, if you as a developer do not put security in your code, no one else will. I promise you that. So writing secure code is not equal to testing the security of the code with tools. So more importantly, if you find a workaround, let your security lead know about it. Tanya, this is for you. <laughs> oh, she uses it a lot. <laughs> so make your life simple. Do all this stuff. Okay, I'm contradicting myself over here. So I'm telling you, you use secure SDLC, you use secure coding guidelines, manage your licenses, secure environment, and so on. So what is all this so on? What are all these things? That's why, you know, we go one step ahead, and that's why you've got developer guide, which gives you an overarching view of how to build applications securely in a secure manner. So we've got, as a part of our developer guide, architecture and design, threat modeling, secure design, risk assessments, and we have got guidelines, how to do input data validation, how to do authn and auth cryptography, error handling, images and containers, open source secure software, logging and auditing, infrastructure as code, session management, and, and there are others as well, and we've got checklists. So what it is really not, Oh, so, oh, sorry, I'll just continue with this. So it will, the developer guide that we've got, it actually helps you not just with secure coding guidelines, but with the entire overarching view, you know, understanding open source software licensing. I don't know, again, this is something else that people, I've seen people do it. They sometimes, sometimes apply a license, but then only during the release phase, they realize that there is a commercial implication to it, and it has not been your MIT license or your Apache 2.0 license. It's something else. You've got to go and pay back to the originator of that open source software. So, you know, all these things matter. And then your environment, your architecture, testing, threat modeling, etc. So that's what the developer guide tells you about, and it helps you find links to the secure architecture, threat modeling, etc. Uh, I've put a link 
on the deck over here to the guide. And this is what it looks like on OWASP.org site. And what it is really not, it does not redefine or reinvent the existing components like threat modeling or web app, app checklists or secure headers. No, no, we are not doing that. We are also not being very technology specific because, you know, if you do it for Angular, if you do it for Java, if you do it for um, C Sharp, C++, etc., etc., it's just going to grow. And also, you know, technology is going to change what was actually, you know, allow listed characters for input data validation, change to regex, change to input, you know, secure libraries, change to frameworks. So it's really difficult to keep up with all of that. So it's not really technology specific. But if any of you want to contribute in terms of technology specific coding checklist, please feel free to do so. But at the moment, we are not doing that. And this is there on GitHub. Um, these are the links. And this is the developer guide. Um, let me actually try and open this. Okay, no, I'm not able to open it. There is a, actually a, a whole a, a printout of this particular um, the developer guide, uh, which I'm unable to open. But you, you can go and visit the site. So what we really need is we need volunteers to review the available content add missing content and enhance the existing content. You know, that's because nobody knows everything about everything and we don't lo live long enough to make all the mistakes in the world and learn from them and add to the developer's guide. And we, we need to support the community, you know, all of us together so that we can all benefit from it and we need a place to go and add our linings, learnings and we can support each other. So this is the team. This is the project leaders for developer guide. Andra is here. Andra, are you here? Andra. <laughs> then uh, we got Harold, John Gadsden, myself, and Vandana. So if you are keen to sponsor our project, feel free to do so. But more importantly, we need volunteers, we need reviewers, we need contributors. Come join us and help the project grow and also help our community. So that's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, um, just ask, obviously, you are building this on GitHub, right? Yes, so, indeed. so just like all OWASP projects, uh, yes. Secure Development Guide is uh, on OWASP uh, GitHub. So you, know, you can just go and contribute and submit uh, pull requests if you wish to yes. contribute. And of course, on the page, you can contact the project leaders. So there's Ruti and Andre here. Absolutely. Okay. Anytime, anytime. Please contact us. And, you know, there is a lot of content on there. Uh, we have also put in a lot of do's and don'ts. What you saw here, it's also there on the um, uh, project. And they're all marked on files. So it's really easy to edit them, add your content, and then submit it for um, check-in. Wonderful. Any questions for Shruti? Oh, yeah, this one. A very nice uh, uh, presentation, by the way. Can I ask, from your from you uh, yourself meeting different uh, companies and people, would it, what is it with developers usually? Is it that uh, maybe the country uh, the, the companies which don't really consider security a really must part of any any sort of application? Are they, I don't know, whether they are unaware, uninformed, or ignorant? No, I think there are multiple. <laughs> no, no, I don't think any of those. I mean, in my experience, um, I think there are, um, there are multiple reasons why people think security as a secondary aspect, mm -hmm. especially developers. That's because one of the key things is um, they, are they are being trained, they are being given a lot of information. And sometimes the actual message can get lost in that plethora of information that they receive. So that's one thing. And second thing is there is always such a thing for speed to market, you know, ship your code into production, that if you can cut corners, people do tend to get cut corners. And there is also another added aspect. Um, I don't want to generalize this, and I don't want to say that's one of the reasons, but sometimes 
um, security people, you know, they have their best intentions at heart, okay, because I'm a security person myself. Then they say, okay, we've got these tools, we've got XYZ tool, we've got ABC tool, we've got this tool, that tool, we'll capture all the defects. No, but you don't capture all the defects. So that's where I think there are conflicting messages given and there is a lot of information. But what developers really need is, do this. This will help you achieve XYZ stuff. I think that's the message that is required to be given. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, that's one more. Oh, two more questions. Hi there. Um, yeah, so sort of following on from that, um, it seems to me like it's part of a wider incentive structure issue around security versus business and economics, right? If you have to spend time and effort and resources training and the literal temple of security that you built there, I see a misalignment of incentives. What incentivizes or what in your experience has been a more successful implementation of an incentive structure that gets developers or companies to value security as a part of successful business. Because the way I see it, is if a business sees security as, an, as a hindrance to business, like it comes back to us what we were saying about WC3, right? Um, like why, why there's so many errors in, in the browser, right? Well, the website works and people can, make, can use it and you make money out of it, so why fix it? Similarly with security, well, the website works, you get the data you need out of it. Who cares if there's an SQL injection that can download the entire database? We're still making two million out of this app. <laughs> um, so uh, I owe allegiance to the companies that I work for and the clients that I work for. But I can hypothesize and tell, answer your question. Um, I, I don't know if incentivizing really helps. I think, in my experience, what I have always tried to tell developers is, if you do this, this happens. So the simple way to fix this is, do X, Y, Z. Hmm. You know, that has worked in some places. But in many places, sometimes it doesn't work because, um, as I said, um, there are the economies to scale and, and People receive so much of training and so much of um, constant badgering to do stuff that sometimes they don't care. Right. I'm not generalizing this. I'm not saying this. Everybody does this, but these are some of the traits. Yeah, I was wondering, like, what sort of successful cases have you seen of like companies that have actually managed to get people to care about security? How did they? get people to care more? Um, so, again, hypothesizing on one of my experience, um, I used to conduct a monthly session on um, the defects that I used to see. And um, I also told them that how to differentiate a false positive from a true positive, and also what a true negative actually does to the software. and. I couldn't get everybody interested in security, but at least the, the developers, some of the senior developers and the chief architect got really interested. And so um, uh, after I started doing those monthly uh, sessions, after a few sessions, I could see a change um, uh, because they realized the impact of not doing certain things. Um, so. That's one of the things that I have, but I can't share any more details about the what, how I went about it, and the details on that. Sorry. Let me get the mic too. One second. <laughs> I, I think the biggest thing is is actually the culture in the company. It's got to come from the top downwards. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that really security works inside a company. So like, I work for a SaaS company and the dev guys there, yeah, they can send their code out. They get their... You know, actually, um, I do agree. It's a top-down approach. But in my experience, if you don't work at the grassroots level, it's very difficult to get that buy-in. 
work with the developers that's why i work a lot with the developers i work with the engineers because that's where it starts even if you can make difference with one developer and one engineer i consider that a success so a lot of workshops a lot of selling but nothing like you know don't do it this way or do it this way but it's the subtle messaging that you need to tell the impact of what what goes what, you know if it goes wrong i mean that's what i have seen works to some extent and also positive reinforcement just like tanya said mm. that's what builds culture absolutely yeah yeah there was a question from sharif uh yeah it wasn't a question but you're talking about the dev guide and uh, contributions mm. would you also take contributions from an ai that's trained on info oh gosh oh, <laughs> oh gosh oh good lord okay um uh, we'll have to sanitize that let me put it that way yeah, definitely yes. we'll take but we'll sanitize it uh, any more questions yeah. building on tanya's talk about automating everything mm -hmm. how much of these guidelines can actually be automated and are you looking for contributions on that um Okay, um, let, let me uh, give a different spin on it. So we've got the developer guide. Um, it's got a lot of things in it. Everything will not be applicable to every situation. It needs to be customized. If you're not using, for example, I'm not saying people don't use it, if you're not having sessions in your applications, why bother about your session? If, you're, if you look at from that perspective, it's very difficult to automate it. You know, it's best to go to the guideline, see what really works for you, customize it. Then, you know, you have something that is really workable. You don't have to keep looking and ticking at everything. Yes, only five of these are applicable. Let's go ahead and use that. You know, that really works. Um, automation, well, it works. I, I'm a big fan of automation. I, well, I have my reservations in this case. So, any more questions? So I imagine one thing that's difficult about, so this guide is a great project. It seems like a great idea, but I imagine it's a very difficult thing to actually construct because when you're trying to teach people about security, it's not like you can often say, give an example and say, if you write the code like this, then it is secure. It requires quite a holistic view to actually write secure code to know about all these potential vectors that may be relevant and all the surrounding context. How do you write a guide when you can't be that prescriptive or just say, this is the way to do it? Okay, so it's not really, um, it is prescriptive some, to some extent, but what it is trying to do is, um, it's, that's why we have not gone down to the technology level, because if I were to say, do it like this in Angular, it may not really work like that for React or for C Sharp. So it's at a level where you say, do input data validation, but choose what you what you want to use depending on the risk that your application faces so you can go ahead and have a allow list of characters that is still fine that is input data validation use regex use you know secure library so we've given options like that so when we say use um, hashing we say you can use hashing but if you have a high risk scenario use hashing with salt use the latest algorithms, you know, or if you have, you have a legacy system and you have to use, say, MD5, determine what's the key length that, you know, it will get exploited within and then rotate your keys. Sorry, not MD5, MD5 is a hash. I'm lying over there. So if you're using DES, triple DES, so it can be broken, the key can be broken in 56 days. So rotate your keys in 40 days. You know, there are, you can still do it securely. But you need to know what you have on hand and what are the secure ways of doing it. So that's what we have tried to give in this guide. Not really very, very prescriptive. Do it this way or don't do it this way. No, sometimes in certain scenarios, you may have to do it, but put a security wrapper around it. Does that answer your question? Uh, one more. How are we doing on time? Oh, we are right. over time. Uh, hi, Shadi. Nice talk on um, the security code. I just want to ask you about, uh, even though we're making a secure code implementation, there are sometimes like we lack, the application lacks the lack of validation, like the logic. 
that's where the business logic vulnerabilities come around right so how do we make sure the developers to understand the logic because i as a pen tester i have so many payment gateways hmm. with the logical in place so how how can we make sure to developers to understand the logic uh, this mainly happens in e-commerce applications and uh, the payment gateways for sure so what do you think on that uh, so if i understand your questions question correctly um you're you're asking how do we explain the different vulnerabilities to the developers what you identify as a product of your testing process is that correct yeah. oh no so although we have secure code implementation in place uh, for an implement let's say they have the proper authentication mechanism or oh. proper validation in place but still the application logs the logic of validation for an example bypassing payment gateway of of a flight book ticket to hmm. 1 rupee or sorry 1 pound or something so these are the cases where the application lacks the logic so how do we make sure the developers to understand the logic how to implement that okay so one of the things that that kind of works is first thing is this authentication access control etc they are features of the application yes they are security requirements but they nonetheless they are features so if you take away the security part of it nonetheless they are features so you test them you know test them as a part of your unit test system testing integration testing whatever you may call it and then by the time you come to pen test phase your vulnerabilities would have reduced i'm not saying it would do away everything but at least you know it reduces the low hanging fruits and that's another thing which we have put in our developer guide do your security testing you know it it need not be fast it need not be fancy sophisticated nothing simple testing authentication brute force try it for 10 times 15 times if it works then your code doesn't work simple as that so you solved it at the first instance okay and let's thank shridhar for an also talk <laughs> thank you <laughs>